Hello, everybody. Welcome back. It is the debrief for the first time in a long, long time. I have to say I'm excited for this one. We've got a lot to talk about, a lot to catch up on. You'll probably let us know in the comment section below the last time we actually did a three-way debrief. I think last time it was myself and Oscar. Then before that, it might have just been myself and Gabe. I can't remember. It's a trio. It's been a while. So we've got a lot to get into. Let's get into it. Right. Well, without any further ado, I will introduce the guests. Um, did you like that, lads? That was that was that was weirdly professional for me, wasn't that was it? it was smooth. That, that was smooth. That. Did you like that, Oscar? It's all. It's, yeah, it's as if I had that, that pre-planned, but I didn't, mate. I'm very. I'm very off the cuff nowadays, mate. Which I don't know if that's a good thing. Um, it would have been better if we were waiting on this other end. Yeah, yeah. It was, that's what I would have done. Yeah. Uh, let's get into a couple of comments. One Ronnie leads. Kip. Ronnie Kipper in evening, Connor. Uh, is Connor all right? I'm absolutely fine, thank you, brothers. How are you, He's mate? Not. Uh, evening, Jason uh, in the building. Uh, loads of people are in here. All an hour and six minutes later, Ethan. I updated the time <laughs> at three p.m., mate. I updated the time at three p.m. You've got to check your schedules, lads. Um, he can't go to. Night. I like that he can't go to bed or do anything else, though. It's good. Devoted subscribers on this channel. That's it. That's it. And, and, and may I just add, there was a certain American who couldn't make 7 p.m. GMT, and his excuse had been nothing short of pathetic. So, mm. listen, don't blame me or Oscar for that one. Working. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> if I'm not on the dole, I don't belong on this channel. That's <laughs> it from you, that. Uh, Kev's in the building. Uh, Southampton postponed as indeed you good, Connor. All good, mate. Um, yeah, and uh, let's get into it, lads. How are we both doing anyway? We'll go to, um, don't know who's probably, uh, Gabe really wants to tell us about this sort of uh, life story. So go on, Gabe, what have you been up to, mate? It's been a, it's been a difficult week for you, hasn't it? <laughs> go on, he wants to tell us. Go on, pour your heart out, we... Gabe. It's been a tough one. Uh, yeah, no, we had we had corporate layoffs, guys. We knew it, so I've been doing the, the interview <laughs> circuit. So thank you for dragging my misery out into the public, you're the best. Why have enemies when you can have friends like Connor listen, on the one least listen, channel? Listen, 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 we're, we're great friends. I have a car crash. He mocks me on the day. Oh, <laughs> that's, true. that's true. We, we have a penchant for like destroying each other in, in low life moments. Oscar could have a dead pet. And I'd probably make a meme out of it. So, uh, you know, um, Oscar's like, man, it actually hits home. I wish you wouldn't do that. <laughs> it's one of them, isn't it? It's just, it's like family guy on WhatsApp group, isn't it? Yeah, it is. It is. Um, well done, Leeds, last night. Yeah, we'll get into that. Baz is in the building as well. Good evening, gents. Um, yeah, a few others in here as well. The Gabe live show. That's what we all need, uh, Ethan, to be honest with you. Yeah, a bit bit mad when it comes to Southampton. I don't think I've ever seen anything quite like that. They're obviously postponed tonight, uh, the Southampton game. Uh, yeah, big sort of fire outside St. Mary's. Very, very odd. Obviously, we hope everyone's all right. I think everyone's fine. But yeah, very odd. Heard about 4 p.m. that it had been postponed. Yeah, couldn't have predicted that in a month of Sundays. But um, Oscar, what's been going on on your agenda, mate? Anything new? What's going on? Um, all good, mate. All good. Um, just being here, there, and everywhere, really, mate. You know, just keeping busy and keeping out of trouble. Um, yeah, you know, it's as a proper northern kind of parent saying that, isn't it? Keeping out of trouble, isn't it? That. <laughs> um, yeah, but no, mate. Keeping busy, keeping busy, and um, and getting stressed by leads again yeah we are we're not making it easy for ourselves last couple of weeks but we're still there we're still we're still annoying it switch as much as we can and that'll do for me yeah i think the last time we spoke obviously we'd have been second in the division we'd have been approaching the huddersfield and uh, i think as a collective i mean i can't really remember the last time last time we spoke to be honest with you but obviously it would definitely be pre the, the huddersfield game and obviously the stoke city game um I mean, I was there last night. Uh, one word which has crept into my mindset when it's come to Leeds over the past couple of, of, of game weeks has been the word fatigue, Gabe. Um, mm. it, it, it feels at this moment in time, obviously those four games in, in 10 days, which obviously we're going to you know, complete that tip box on when it comes to Sheffield Wednesday on Friday night. It's... It's, it's eventually getting to the lads, it feels like, at this moment in time. I think it's it's sort of written across the squad, really. I mean, what are your thoughts on that, mate? Yeah, it's it's clear that they're... we were talking about this midfield specifically being fatigued weeks ago. Weeks ago, like in December. Um, it's, it is pretty noticeable. Now, I got to say, under normal circumstances, you'd be able to rest these guys. Because under normal circumstances, what I mean is historical precedent in the league, how many points... Uh, the top three or four teams have accumulated at this point in the season in years past, 
you wouldn't have to win every game at this near historic clip, but you have three, four teams in the division that are um, performing at a rate that I, I don't know. I don't know if it's ever happened where this many teams at this period of time were, were accumulating points like this. So you can, we can make con contextual excuses and, and reasons for it. It's not really excuses that they're actual reasons, but this is the, the, the race we're in. All right. So over the ne these next 10 games, nobody's going to care if we're fatigued or not. They're going to go for the jugular. And uh, so I, I'm a little concerned about it um, because there's no like clear solution. Now, I think, I think we may have saw a little bit of it with um, seems like, Farker gave um, Archie Gray a little bit of a rest. I wonder if he's planning to rotate him into the midfield, which I think would be a good decision. Um, you can see some of the wear and tear on uh, guys like Glenn Kamara. Even Gruev has, hasn't been quite as sharp as he was, but I mean, we're still managing to grind out results. I'm a little bit concerned, though, uh, given the run of games we have, and we know some of the way some of these teams are going to play us. They're just going to try to physically beat us up and disrupt us from doing what we like to do on the ball um, and in transition. So um, I think to the point I saw you make on social media and some of the people are making in the chat, the sooner we can get Ampadu back in the midfield and uh, center half position strengthened with Pascal, the better. Not that he's been poor there, but we're talking about depth and, and freshness. It's just not as physically grueling uh, to play center half as it is, well, I guess, depending on the team you're on, but for Leeds as it is to play central midfield. And uh, yeah, I, um, I'm confident going into these next 10 games, but the fatigue has to be a little bit of a concern. Yeah, Oscar, I don't know if you were there last night, mate. Presumably you were, but I mean, I, you know, you're watching it and um, I knew, I thought it'd be tight. There was people in and around me saying it was going to be three, four, even I, one person said five. And me and my old man were there and we we just had this same opinion. We thought it's very Barnsley, Bielsa, 18, 19. Mm -hmm. Obviously that Barnsley side yeah. ripped us apart that day and we won the game 1-0 and they were much better outfit than what Stoke were. But um, it's the bottom, you know, they were bottom four or five, I think, that day. And they came to Leeds and and, and Leeds were just churned out the win, uh, just churned out the win. I mean, do you, it's hard to say, you know, it was disappointing because it's our, what, we've won 10 games in 11. You can't be disappointed by it. It, it is just the contextualization now, mate, of what a freak season this is. I mean, I think Johnny Cooper put out there, the Opta statistician who works very closely with Leeds, obviously, that team, a team on Southampton's level now has never not been promoted on what, 70 points or on. They've never not been promoted at championship level at this stage of the season. And there's four teams, you know, in excess of that point tally, if you kind of, you know, include Southampton within that. It's it's mental, isn't it, mate? And you've never seen anything like it. And it was interesting in the ground. I don't know if you picked up on it, Oscar, but Bristol went 2-1 up on 81 minutes and everyone around me was buzzing, you know, high five and all this sort of stuff. And I went, there's no chance they're done yet. There's no chance. I just, and they just keep winning, don't they? It's, and, and, you know, I don't know if you did. Once again, I'm, I'm going on a bit of a ramble here like I normally do, but I, kept, I sort of came out the ground and I was a little bit like, huh. you know, I don't know. I don't know what it was. I, th I think what I'd say it is, is it's a kind of low key. I think it is low key, really. Last four games, we've won three out of them, three out of the four, and drawn the other one. But yeah. I could, I said last night on All East TV, I wouldn't have had any complaints if out of the net last four games, if we hadn't have won any of them based on performance. I honestly don't think we've been great last four games. Um, yeah, we've got the wins, we've got the results, we've seen it through, we've won games in different ways. That's not well, you no think bad it, you, thing. You, you, you think any game could have gone either way, is what you're saying? Yeah, I do. I do really yeah. think that. Yeah, I think certainly yeah. the Leicester game, the Plymouth game, the second half, you know, Plymouth had you know, similar kind of spells of pressure as what Stoke did. Maybe not to the same extent as last night, but I think that's what it more is, is that the last couple of games we haven't been fully firing. And mm. I don't think it's necessarily a tactical issue. I think it's just more three or four players have dropped off at the same time form-wise. Whether that's down mm. to fatigue or just general drops off in form, who knows? But I think that is the issue we've got at this moment in time. You know, I think Gabe alluded to Gruev. I think Gruev, I'm a massive fan of his, but I think last four games... I haven't been his best. Yeah, I agree. Average. He's not been I poor. He's not been poor so much. He has still been, you know, has an impact on the pitch, but not to the same extent as before. I think, like Kamara, Kamara, I, think I think, I think just to interject and add to your point as well, Oscar, hmm. I think I, 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 the last couple of games, definitely I'd put Kamara in that bracket as well. Yeah, I'd, I'd say so. I think, I think he was good against Leicester, but I think the other games, not so much. Um, Somerville and Rutter, I think there's no hiding from the fact that both have had a, not a massive drop-off in form, but a drop-off in form where they're not as unstoppable as what they were 
you know, two or three weeks ago. And I've no doubt these players will come back. But I think maybe you look at it out of the last five games, say, including the cup game against Chelsea, I think the Chelsea cup game is our best performance. Yes, we lost, yep. but yep. that performance was where we saw Gray and Amper doing midfield. And I do think that's the key. I think you've alluded to it, Connor. It's just finding that way to get either Gray or maybe even both Gray and Amper doing midfield. And I think that will unlock Kamara and Gruev alongside him, whoever plays there. I personally thought Conor Roberts had a solid game yesterday. Nothing yeah, thought, that made me go was, wow was, necessarily, thought, but I, it was a good. I, I, I thought he was. I thought he was probably the best player. I think. Yeah, I thought it was a good seven out of ten performance from him. I, I thought that right inside works pretty well against uh, against Stoke in terms of Roberts and James. Obviously, they're used to playing alongside each other on that side for Wales, so I wasn't too concerned when I saw the team sheet come in. And Roberts just had a nice solid game, and I saw enough from Roberts to say. OK, let's try Archie in midfield and Gru Evan Kamara alongside him against Sheffield Wednesday. I do think it's got to the point now where we're still winning games, but I think there is more rotation needed. And ultimately, yeah. it was the rotation last night of Dan James coming in that won us the game, really. You know, the fact that we were a bit more bold, we did try and change things up a little bit. Um, not because of necessarily Nonto was playing poorly, just to keep things fresh. You know, I think that's what mm -hmm. Farker has done well since January. You know, he, when he's needed to make a change, he's made the right changes. And last night, despite it not being a great performance, the change he did make ultimately won us the game in terms of Jan, Dan James getting the winner. So I do think there's a case for more changes against Sheffield Wednesday. And I don't think it's a big concern for me. I think it's just the fact that we've, we're more 7 out of 10 at this moment in time in terms of the last couple of weeks compared to when we were kind of 8 and 9 out of 10. Yo, in the couple yeah. of weeks prior to that, and he's of course, got he's got he's, he, Oscar. Oscar, he's got. To, for me, and Gabe, I want you to chime in on this and give me your opinion, mate. Uh, when you've got Connor Roberts at this moment in time, and you've got that ace card, a Premier League right back. Let's be honest, uh, a Welsh international, and he's there, ready and waiting, and he's come on and done really well. Scored, got an assist, so fine. He come, he's coming on. I know it sounds daft, and you can't measure it, but. He spoke really, really articulately, articulately and well um, on the on the Leeds United podcast. I know it doesn't it doesn't mean anything, but he's really, really here for the right reasons. I feel you know you, you hear some lone players, and listen, there's there's maybe an argument that a certain lone player came here and and you know his head wasn't in the right space. Conor Roberts' head is definitely in the right space, and I just feel with Archie's performance, I understand it with Ampadu, with Archie's performance against Chelsea, I thought it was the wrong move to be honest with you, not putting him in central midfield against Huddersfield. And I said that before the game, but I, you know, I thought it was madness not playing, not, not letting Joseph have any minutes whatsoever, you know, against Huddersfield as well. But I think you even saw the other night and I just want to bring these two in really. Joseph came on and I just think he's more incisive. He's quicker. He's a problem. I feel, and I think he's a bit more of a nightmare to Mark than, than someone like Patrick Bamford. I, li I like Bamford, of course I do. Do you think, Joseph, I've kind of made this comparison before, it might have even been on the debrief, he feels yeah. like this season's in Ketia almost, in terms of he just injects energy into a game and you feel like he can get crucial goals. It, it wouldn't surprise me if over the next, you know, the final two months of the season, if he doesn't get us two or three really important goals that we look but, back but on. Oscar, but Oscar, Oscar, for me, for me, these ace cards... Conor Roberts at right back, Archie into the middle, and Matteo Joseph up front. You've got rotation there, but you've got quality at this level. You've got serious quality in rotation there, and it freshens everything up as well. Archie's obviously been left out from the start last night. You put him back in central midfield where he can dictate a game more. That midfield, in my opinion, right now, I agree with you. The last two or three games, I think it's been slacking a little bit. I think they've got the handbrake on a little bit, to be honest with you. And um, I'd, 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 listen, I'm not, I'm not calling for wholesale changes but I think fatigue's playing a, a big part at the minute and I think it needs freshening up um, Gabe I mean where's your head at with it are you sort of uh, uh, in the bracket of look Connor maybe you've been a bit overzealous there maybe you know do we need that many changes we've won 10 in 11 and I completely understand that or are you in the camp of look there is some changes that that need to be made quickly here because maybe we're coming a little bit predictable in certain areas well I think there's a couple ways to look at it I mean the the Decision that wins is the decision I like. And, you know, I think we're all seeing the signs of fatigue, but he's gone ahead and arrested Archie Gray. If that's because he's just going to drop Archie Gray uh, out of the right back position, I doubt that that's the case. Seems like the player needed a rest. And um, whereas I don't typically believe in over indexing a single performance uh, at a particular position and saying, 
okay, this is going to be normative. I think a lot of uh, evaluation mistakes happen with players that way. It's not like we haven't seen a long data case for Archie Gray's inclusion in the central midfield position anyway. He's gone from strength to strength this season. But we've said from the very beginning, you don't want to run him into the ground. Um, so it seems like if you know if you're playing Stoke, you run with the uh, with the midfield you have, and then you bring Archie Gray in uh, later on. And that's if that's what Fark is doing, I think it's it's very smart. Um, but look, I, I mean, we've said this from the jump that this is a young team that's going to make a lot of mistakes, and some of this certainly comes comes to fatigue for sure. Um, but um, this is actually a good comment as well. But I think to round off what, what Oscar was saying, and I think Oscar, you said it in a way I totally agree with. It's not that they've been bad. They just set a really high stand, standard for themselves and they haven't been quite as sharp. And that does come with fatigue. So you'd like to see a little rotation in there. I would be kind of against wholesale changes at this point, like massive changes. I think there's a couple changes that Connor, we've discussed. Uh, Oscar, I don't know if we've discussed it yet. I think... I'm about done seeing um, uh, Piro on the pitch at this point as the first man off the bench. I understand the value, and I, I probably still would go with Bamford. I think some matches are better for him, some matches aren't. But Mateo Joseph has to be first off the bench in that in that position. Look, what did I say from the very beginning? He's going to have to take his chances in the cup, and that necessitates him being played in the league. That's exactly what he did, and he was he was a menace and a nuisance. And he does give you something different to what both of you have said. So a little rotation here and there, but look, you know, you don't want to, you don't want to get so deep in the weeds of analysis that you start inflating problems before they're actually problems. Yeah. It's a difficult game against Stoke. Um, and I think we were fortunate to win. I mean, we talked about Dan James. I want to give another player credit who stepped up, hasn't had a lot of games like this, this season. But we have to give Elon Melier some credit here. He made some really timely interventions and I, I think did well for us and has done well for us since Leicester. So I want to give him some credit there. I think at this point, the, the question is... You're not looking at him for that Huddersfield goal, no? No, not really. No, I think the defense puts him in an, an impossible position. Can yeah, Could he done, have done a little bit better? Yeah, but guy's going to score no matter what. Um I think it's what you look at it one at it one of two two ways. You have ten matches left. Are you going to ride the horse that got you here, or you're, are you going to change things up a little bit? I think some subtle changes, like who comes off the bench first, who plays in what position. Pascal for me comes right back into the team. I think we've all talked about this, so someone's going to have to have to be dropped. But at this point, I'm not looking for, you know. I, I I think it would be a mistake to to make wholesale changes. I think it would be a mistake to run with Joseph as the starter going forward. He's had one really good game and, and an impactful uh, of sub, sub appearance, and that's been really positive. And it's enough for me to say, okay, Piro's had stinker after stinker after stinker. This kid's hungry. Get him more game time. I'm not ready to say let's make him our starting number nine yet. I'm not quite ready to say um, uh, that we need to completely revamp a midfield that's been passing at a rate of over 93% pass accuracy and re retaining the ball. We continue to dominate possession where it's weak is the final third. But to be honest, as much as Kamara needs to do better in the final third, so does Jorginho. Jorginho has been all over the place up and down the last couple matches. And so is Somerville. This, these are young players. So this is what happens when you ride with players who are under the age of 22. Sometimes you get brilliant performances and they're unplayable. And sometimes you, you get, you know, stinkers. But the fact is we've still won even when they've been playing poorly. I can't I can't even name a handful of players who really impressed me last match, and we won. Now, granted, Stoke is trash, but th that does count for something. And I think that you grind out results, you try to get the rest where you can, and you do some, some rotation, which I think Fark is doing. So I think that's probably the wise approach. Yeah. I mean, I think the thing with Gruev and Kamara is I, the pass accuracy thing, and it, you know, you, it's how you dictate possession, isn't it? It's listen, it's modern football. Uh, Pep Guardiola's made an absolute career out of it, killing teams by controlling possession, and it's it's how you do it nowadays. And you pass, you pass, you pass laterally to try open up spaces. Um, and if everyone, anyone could do it, anyone would, and they're they're not like th those two guys together or those three counting at Ampadu. Have been I, I, in the upper echelon of the of the championship, and uh, they're, they're 
metrics look really good. It doesn't always look the best, and they are exposed as being a little bit overly static, mechanical in the final third. And if the creative players aren't firing, like Somerville hasn't been and Jorginho hasn't consistently been, it it lays to bear what they can't do, and which is why they're championship players. But I, I think I think I think I think I think though we don't want to I don't want to put too much onus on the pass accuracy because I think it's I think I'd you know we, I'd like to see almost like a map of where these passes are going because I'm watching Gruev and and it's it's very technical what he does and I'm watching Gruev and I've watched him live. I think he's a very tidy footballer. It was perfectly described to me by Kev, who's in the comments here, who's at the game with me, said he's tidy. And he is. He's, I think he's an upgrade on Adam Forshaw. The problem is, I, I don't think at this moment in time, we've got enough incisiveness going through that midfield. And that's where I look at someone like Archie Gray, someone who can drive through the middle. What I am seeing, and what I have seen in the last couple of games, is Ampadu occupying the midfield role. I'm seeing Ampadu get the ball and drive through the middle from centre-back. And I've seen Rodon do that a little bit more. And I think... Yeah, you can call that tactical, but I do think at some points they're taking the the almost onus on themselves to move leads forward because I think Gruev and Kamara are struggling to do so right now. Hundred percent, mate. Um, you don't think we're making know, enough chances, though. I mean, I think, it, I think, I think, I think, I think we are, and and I think I'm watching them, and I, I think uh, it's really, really simple. If I'm if I'm simplifying it all, I think they're both playing with the handbrake on at this moment in time. I think it's risk averse and it's safety first in just retaining possession. I don't think there's anybody taking risks from that defensive pivot at the minute. I'm not, I don't think that's notorious in their role, by the way. I really don't. Yeah, don't that's what think... I was going to say, Oscar, before you yeah. jump in. Uh, I think well, yeah. if if Jorginho and Somerville are playing better and not losing the ball a million times by holding the ball too long or, or not being decisive in, in the box, I don't think we're even having this conversation, right? I, I think that if they're but firing all but, 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 but Gabe, I would say the problem now is, and I'm not saying he's not he's been figured out whatsoever, but I think when, when I've been watching Rutter the last couple of games, when he's not completely on point, when I don't think when he's not an eight and above in a single game, which you know fatigue can creep into it, mm -hmm. but if he's not an eight and above, we do lot lose a lot of offensive impetus in that in that. 10 8 role, and I think Archie yeah. in there. I think Archie potentially in there. You know, we know he, he loves to get a shot off, we know he likes to drive through the heart of the opposition defense. We know he likes to drive. Have we ever seen the... Archie in a 10? No, we've not seen Archie in 10. I'm, I'm talking about like an eight, like an eight okay. role where he's going to get the ball and he's going to run forward. I'd see, I see him as a box to box midfielder. But what I'm saying is, yeah. I think Archie offers us something a little bit more than what Kamara does right now. I think the problem with Kamara a lot of the time, and me and you have spoken about this game, me and you know, Oscar, I think we've had a bit of a chat about it. I think there's a there's an opportunity at the Huddersfield game, which was just almost symptomatic of how yeah. how him in that final third for me doesn't really work at this moment in time. Um, you know, we get a really good opportunity in the first three minutes. Non Rutter puts Nonto through. Nonto cuts it back. Kamara just has to put it in the back of the net. He then elects to pass it to Somerville when Somerville's not even ready for the ball. Somerville's all, almost on his back foot, leans back, should have scored, didn't. Nichols made a good save. But in that in that moment right there, I'm looking at an Archie Grant, I'm thinking he's just putting the ball in the back of the net. And it's simple. And I think sometimes with Kamara, he just will not strike the ball. And I think if, if he's your furthest midfielder, furthest midfielder, because that that's what I would call him. I'd say he's the most advanced of the double pivot. If he's your furthest forward, I expect more from him in terms of goals. I expect more from him when it comes to shots on goal. And you just don't see it at all. Okay. And I think Archie gives us a lot more there right now, personally. Yeah, I think I was confused when you were talking about Jorginho. I thought you meant like uh, Archie would be better in that position. No, it makes sense in the uh, in the double pivot. And I do agree with it. Uh, I just think, you know, it, it's right. Well, I'm not going to belabor it since we do agree. But it's, it's one of those things where it, it's hard to make a sudden massive change with, with the stakes so high if we drop if it doesn't work and we drop points you know uh i think it's going to be easy in hindsight to say daniel farco what are you doing starting a 17 year old in a dual pivot you've not played in there all season the underlying data earlier wasn't particularly good when he was with ampadu then you had these other guys who um who were you know it's easy to make the but that's why he's paid the big bucks to make the decisions oh Oscar, Stan, it's um I think what I'd say with Kamara and Gruev is if you look at the football they've played before coming to Leeds over the last couple of years, especially Kamara, they haven't played consistently over the sort of last two years or so. And maybe that sudden kind of change of being in the team week in, week out, certainly at this kind of level where it is a physically very testing level. 
Um, I think you have seen that maybe a little bit in terms of winning the ball back in terms of Gruev and Kamara. There have been times, I think we have lost that compactness centrally in terms of the screens to back four. So that's out of the possession. I just think there's a little bit of fatigue there with both. Maybe you do, I think you, Archie does need to start for me in midfield. I do really genuinely, genuinely believe that. I think he's our highest potential player um, and also our highest potential midfielder. Um, you know, the one with the highest ceiling, the one that can really change a game for us in that position. But I think with Kamara, in terms of going forward, I think when teams sit off us and Somerville and Rutter have been a little bit less effective, um, just genuine drops off in form. I don't think there's anything tactical as such. A lot of it's coming now down to Kamara in that left sort of space in between mm. Rutter and Somerville to kind of like get moves going. And that isn't Kamara's game. But I think the only reason that's we're finding Kamara in those positions is that Rutter and Somerville are getting crowded out. They haven't quite able to just jink past the player. You know, it, it's just not as easy for him to do that. Right. Um, it will come. There's no question about it. That is not a concern to me. I'm not saying they can't beat a man anymore. That, that's not what I'm saying at all. I just think these last couple of weeks, certainly with, um, you know, Gigi Rutter, he's lost the ball in really bad areas and it's lost our control of it. And I had to get it in there. I had to get it in there. I thought, I've not said Gigi yet. And we're almost half an hour into the video. Mm. Um, but yeah, I think you've seen it with Rutter. When he loses the ball in bad areas, certainly last night, we lose control of the game. And then all of a sudden, Rams do a lot of work out of possession. Um, and we're getting caught in transitions a little bit. But so I think some of it is down to players such as Kamara and Gruev not being used to playing this much football consistently. And I think another bit of it is the inexperience of your Rutter, Somervilles. Mm. You know, they aren't especially experienced players. And I think that's maybe telling at this stage of the season. I'm not saying it's going to be the case for the whole season, but I think at this stage of the season, that is the case. But the reason we're still winning games is that Ampadu and Rodon have just been absolutely phenomenal, yep. basically. Yeah, I'm not saying we're just reliant on those two, but they have been at the very least seven, eight out of ten, literally mm. every game. Literally every game. I can't think of a bad game they've had. Like, honestly, I, they have been absolutely, I can't even sum up in words how consistent they've been. As well, and Oscar, Oscar, if you can't, Oscar, Oscar, if you can't, listen, if you're struggling to score as well and you struggle in offensively, the big thing is just don't concede. And that's yeah, the beauty of that line of the minute. That, that's the I, one I, thing I, about the dual pivot, though, that I, I do want to interject. And like, we're t we don't know, right? Just as we don't know how good Archie will be there. I mean, we have confidence to think that he would be. But I do wonder, because he is 17, he's been great in a right-back position, and he was really, really good against Chelsea. And he it's not like he was poor playing uh, in that dual pivot in the beginning of the season, but we did see the metrics sh show that the whether it be Gruev, whether it be Kamara, that partnership with, with Ampadu was, was, uh, was stronger. One thing I do know, it, it, just watching this team, it's not just the center halves. It's the way the dual pivots. Um, some of that conservative play keeps a defensive shape to not get hit on a counter. And when we've seen that, like when we've had, now we've seen the rotation in the center half position, like when, when we've seen uh, Liam Cooper come in, some of the communication with those dual pivots hasn't been nearly as good. And we've conceded more, more and more chances. I would, I think part of the concern might be, and look, I have no idea what, what Farka might be concerned about, but, when you do introduce somebody who hasn't been in that partnership, there always is a risk to your defensive structure, especially if one tends to be a little bit more forward thinking. So I think that that factors into it. Again, this is strictly hypothetical. I'm not saying for a moment that I don't think Archie Gray would be as disciplined or as impactful in that tool, dual pivot role. I just, I'm just saying these are things that come into it because it's a big decision to make with 10, uh, 10 games to go I with, actually uh, think in the rest of the season. I genuinely think it would be stronger. You know, not just necessarily Maybe. because of Archie. Yeah. I think just the fact Roberts at right back. I think Gray has been. I think he's been amazing all season. But I just think purely one v one against a winger, I'm probably backing Connor Roberts. You know, yeah. over Archie Gray. To be honest, um, I think Gray is far and above better on the ball. I think he's probably better on the ball than pretty much most players in this least team. Outside, he's too, good, he's too, he's too, he's too good of a footballer to be at right back. He's too yeah, good. I, agreed. I think it's got to that stage now. I 100% I hear what Gabe's saying, you know, in terms of discipline in that lot, you know, in terms of can he stay in And I'm not even saying I think he would be bad. I'm just saying that it's something yeah. that has to go into the manager's mind, it's, especially when it's, I mean, look, normal circumstances, you could just do it and we'd be pretty secure in a top two spot. This is such a weird, unique season. And this is the race we find ourselves in, right? So the margins are going to be, I mean, think about the margins yesterday. We had a couple minutes, and I'm with Connor. I didn't believe for a second that Bristol City was going get, to get the job done against Ipswich. But we had 
this is the difference of being second and third. The margins are razor thin. Yeah. So one false step, one decision that doesn't work out well for you. Similar. It's actually similar to what it's like in the Premier League as a manager of one of those bottom ten teams. It's what would in normal cer- financial circumstances. It's a Premier League be four. It's a prim- but it's a Premier League four at the minute, isn't it? Let's be honest. Yeah. Well. It's a relegation threatened Premier League for. <laughs> the other thing as well with Archie is, as Connor alluded to, and I, I, we've kind of all spoken about in terms of Kamara in the final third. He's, it's not even a case of he's not great in the final third. He just doesn't look comfortable in the final third. When he gets yeah. the ball, he just he looks like a different player. If you compare it to, compare it to when he gets the ball in the other two thirds of the pitch, he looks so comfortable on it and like he can. He's never going to lose it. But in that final third, it's just. Where the play's a little bit more condensed, you know, you have to right. find those slide rule passes and just open up spaces. That isn't Glenn Kamara's game, but I think if you have Archie picking up the ball in in those areas and Glenn Kamara sitting, I think that works better. Um, or Gruev sitting, I think that works better as well. I just yeah, I think quite, I, I, I quite like the balance of um, Gruev and Archie in there. I like that. Yeah, I, I, to be honest, I don't really. I'm not really fussed. You know who comes out for Gru- um, for Archie in terms of Gruev or Kamara. It, it doesn't really fuss me too much. I think there's benefits to both of them. And I don't think it's because they're not good enough for this level or anything like that. I think they're really, really good players. But I think over the season, you're going to have dips in form and it's just about reacting to those dips in form. And I think over a whole season, especially 46-game season, you've just got to keep finding that 1%, 2% extra all the time. And I just mm-hmm. think at this moment in time, Robert's going to right back, Archie into midfield, linking up with Rutter, in the central areas, open up the spaces for Dan James and Somerville then on the sides, Patrick Bamford or Joseph through the middle, probably Patrick Bamford for me, Joseph Moore as an impact sub. Yeah. I think that just gets that extra 2 or 3% where we start, rather than beating teams by narrow margins, we start getting you know comprehensive again, like we were against Cardiff away, like we were against Swansea away. It's just those small little changes. And for me, Daniel Farker has made them all season. Um, mm-hmm. And it might not even be the talk... Daniel Farker this season has made two or three changes that we haven't even spoke about, spoken about or considered on the debrief, you know, in terms of, you know, where did that come from kind of thing? You know, I don't think any of us thought Guerrero would come into the team in January and make the impact he made, you know, based on his first few games. So I'm very confident Farker would be cooking something up in terms of, you know, he won't be happy the last four or five games. He kind of has alluded to it, um, not massively in his press conferences, but I think the last couple of weeks is little bit of frustration, you know, in terms of our performance levels. But did you did you agree? Did you, did, you, did you agree that it was? Did you agree when he said yesterday after the game that it was the performance of the season? Or do you think he's almost just trying to mask it? Really? I think, like, what do you think? I think in terms of mentality and just being able to see through games because the pressure was on us last night. You know, he is yeah, it right in saying that. You know, the fact that. It was the first time all season we've gotten ourselves into a position where it was in our hands and then we lost it straight away. And then you've seen with Leeds teams in the past, you know, Bielsa Leeds teams, once psychologically you lose that control on the top two race, you know, we lost our heads, you know, in that first Bielsa season. And it's so easy. We've seen so many teams do that. Southampton, you know, in the last couple of weeks, you know, we've had one bad result and it turned into three or four bad results. And I think that's maybe what Farker was alluding to rather than performance level. I just think in terms of how big the win was. And don't get me wrong, if we do get promoted, I will look back on that game last night and say, yes, that was absolutely massive in terms of a clean sheet and winning that way. And they were the games at the start of the season we weren't winning. Yeah, we'd have drawn that's that. right. We'd have drawn that start of the season for me or we'd have probably lost the game at Huddersfield and probably drawn the game at Plymouth. You know, that, that is the difference to this Leeds team. But I think the issue... I don't mind it, you know, one-off games or maybe two games in the row where we're a little bit off it. But I think when it's four games on the bounce, you're thinking, okay, maybe need to slightly change something and just get back to... And, and the, Oscar, Oscar the, the context here as well is, I mean, I mentioned it on a video earlier on, the bottom half teams now playing like top half teams. You've got Huddersfield, you've got Chef Wednesday, yeah. you've got um, Millwall in there. They've all changed managers and suddenly there's a change in form and we see it so often in the championship us being there 16 years we saw it every year we try to do it numerous times trying to stay in the championship where we'd have a change of manager and it'd uplift us a little bit and we'd get away from that relegation pot and you're seeing it right now um obviously Millwall off the back of a, a good little run Sheffield Wednesday five wins in six Huddersfield doing okay with the new German manager at this moment in time as well so I think these, these games- texts are huge 
but it, but, it, but, but, it, but, it, but it is it is so interesting, isn't it? Because we look at Wednesday, we look at Huddersfield, we look at Millwall, we look at Watford, teams like this, and we think are bankers. And caliber wise, quality wise, well, they are bankers because our squad value is worth three, four times what theirs is, and our squad caliber is four, five, t- six times the caliber of theirs. But football just doesn't work like that. It just does not work like that. And we've seen that in the Huddersfield game. We've seen that in the Stoke game, even though Stoke have got a, probably a higher calibre side to where they should be, really. But it it really does it really does throw a lot into the picture, really, doesn't it? And um, yeah, I mean, Leeds have got a... Sheffield Wednesday is not going to be an easy game whatsoever. And it could be one of the toughest games in the division from being one of the easiest games in the division. Every match we have, to, to your point, and, and what you were talking about with, with Farka's statements... I think what he's trying to say is, I mean, we have 10 games left. A lot of them are against very scrappy teams. We may, inconceivably, given the run of form we've been on, we, we be, may be facing a scenario where we have to win 9 or 10 out of 10 games to ensure an automatic promotion spot, which is crazy to think about. And we could spend all our time being like, oh, you know, that's, but it's this is what we have to do if we're not going to be worried about other teams' performances. So, which we shouldn't be. We should never be... The, the the scoreboards thinking and putting our, our fate into the hands of other teams. So um, I'm quite happy with that. And he's 100% right. Every game is a cup final for the next 10 weeks, in, yeah, in my opinion. It and um, it may feel ridiculous, but th- that's the case. So I don't care what he has to say or do to get our guys over the line. Um, I think I think in a, just to add a bit of context there, Gabe. I, I I think someone just corrected me in the chat. I think he said in 2024, not of the seasons. So. Oh, okay. Well, we've we've gone on our run in 2024, so f- fair enough. Uh, you know, I, I think what I will say is, I know that we tend to be an anxious lot as a fan base with good reason. You know, we're a habitually and chronically traumatized fan base, but I think that we have to start approaching these matches with enthusiasm. Uh, as a collective fan base, because look at the run of form we're on. Look at the, this is a historic race, and we have a chance to do something really, really special. And we have, if I would rather be us right now, then I'd rather be Southampton or, or rather be Ipswich. Their schedules are tougher than ours. And yeah, none of these teams are going to are gonna, uh, give us an easy game. None of them. Um, they're going to come in, they're going to kick our players, they're going to try to physically rough us up. I mean, the statistics from, from Stoke, I mean, this is pretty staggering stuff, right? When you just look at the fouls, it was something like, what was it? 13 to seven. I mean, they, they almost doubled, uh, you know, uh, on physical contact that you're not allowed to do. And it, some of it was borderline as well. Um, but even in a match like that where we're tired. Could I where... just, inter- I was just to interject because I've got quite a big thing on the fouls. Do you think teams are getting more and more aggressive against us? It wasn't yeah, you, you, you have to. The young field. players... Players who like to dance around folks in the in the attacking third absolutely put a boot into Somerville or or, or Jorginho. I would. I've really noticed. One hundred percent would. Kind of, no, but yeah. no, but no, but away. No, but the why, why? Why? Why did they do that? They wouldn't do it in the Premier League because VAR is going to stamp down on it. Huddersfield would have. Well, I don't. Would, no, I don't mean. I don't mean like do a, a no, 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 but, no, but the, the, the whole point. The whole point to it is the referees at this standard, and we, we have to we have to speak about it, the Huddersfield game was a, a symptomatic of it, are horrific, and there is no aid of VAR. So if you're getting rough with Leeds United, I mean, okay, you're relying on a referee to be competent. And I'm being serious. I'm being deadly serious with it. But Connor, even if you're if you're on the other side, on the good side of the line in terms of what's allowed, it's just smart to get in the grill of young players. Uh, who and try to physically frustrate them and get in their heads and take them off their game. That's that's what should happen if you're a less talented team playing a more talented, younger, and maybe less seasoned group of professionals. That's what you want to do to take them out of it. That's what every one of these teams is going to do, with the exception maybe of Southampton when we play them well, in the think, final game of the season. But I like, but, but, but I, I, yeah, I, I agree with that, Gabe. I completely agree with it. But I think there's a there's a you know there's a, there's a greater point here of these players needing to be protected by the officials. You know, we look at the Huddersfield yeah. game. Hogg should, Hog should have been sent off twice. Pearson should have been sent off. Yeah. It, 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 don't it's just not going to happen, but it's, you're, the right. To, you're right. The way to play against Somerville and Rutter is to stop the momentum. You know, the one yep. thing Somerville and Rutter oh. like is to beat one man and be able to just drive with the ball. But if they beat the man and then get fouls, it, it kills the momentum. You know, that, that is the way those two players love to play. And it's, it's what's been their success so, this I, season. I, 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 I think as well, Oscar, Nonto in this equation is a big problem as well because 
if he's getting fouled consistently, he gets dragged into it. And this yeah, is a problem when, it, when we're looking at rotation with nine weeks left. If teams, and we saw it with Stoke last night, Gabe's bang on the money. You can see it in the crowd. The crowd were going, getting hyped up at the, the amount of fouls that Stoke were giving away. And we said on a couple of shows before, aren't they going to 100% employ what Huddersfield did? And they tried to do that last night, albeit with a little bit more football. So will in. Sheffield Wednesday and Millwall. Oh, <laughs> Sheffield. They, they absolutely Sheffield, will. 100%. Oscar, 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 Sheffield Wednesday did it under Darren Moore at the start yeah. of the season. Imagine what they're going to... But this is, this is the whole point. This is why... I get marginally frustrated with some of the basics that we need to we need to improve on. We have to improve on set pieces. We have to be better well, at scoring the yeah. crappy set pieces. In off but the, the goal we conceded, yeah, all the fouls in that game. Yeah, you know, I can't. I don't know what the stats were in that game in terms of fouls. But the one time we lose our heads, we give away a free kick and we can see from it against Huddersfield. And yeah. you think all the and, time Huddersfield lost their heads, and it, it just sums up where we're at. We, Again, oh, to that point, it. Oscar, let, let me just hack this on, on on there, and you can keep going. Our players, like I'm mainly, I'm thinking about Somerville and Jor, uh, Jorginho. When you're to speak to Connor's point, the officiating in this division is so bad. There are going to be clear and obvious fouls on these players, and some of the referees aren't going to like that they carry the ball and do fancy stuff and yeah. tell them to get up. So they have I'm to just. Move I, I, I'm gen, I'm genuinely convinced of that. I'm convinced. No, I, I, we've seen oh, it, and, and other still it. players you suffer the same. Daylight. So they have to understand that in their heads. We we can talk about how it's not just, but they, they need to be say, okay, fine. Well, when the space closes down, I need to release the ball quicker. Things need to be faster and maybe a little bit less ticky tack. Like you're not going to get contact fouls unless they're clear and obvious, like above the ankle. Can I just, I'm just going to put in here, uh, Chris uh, Richmond's uh, become a member. Shout out to Chris. Keep up the brilliant work. Keep up uh, your comments in. Everybody will obviously read out the super chats first, then the member uh, chats first as well, but then keep getting your comments in as well. Uh, Cressel would help or Cooper. Corners are abysmal, I must admit. Um, I'm I'm struggling with the chat. There are a lot of Ipswich fans in here. I've not, I've not spotted any. Uh, if it was noticeable watching the top three yesterday, our Leicester, Leeds and Ipswich look very, look leggy. Uh wary Ipswich didn't start to perform until they went 1-0 down. It's interesting <laughs> with them it. all season. But the, yeah. this, this is the thing, and I can't... I said this on a video early on. I think they're going up. They're, they're just going up. I I, I don't know... I, I, you know, and that doesn't mean cause there's, there's, there's three places available. There's three places available, but I am convinced they're going up. I, they are just not slowing down. They had a bit of a blip. Now they've won six, six in a row. They just never say die and this it, it's it, i can't I'm, I'm struggling now hearing the concept and it can switch of course it can they've got hull away they've got coventry away they've still got southampton to play as well and i understand this sort of conceding ridiculous amount of goals is going to equal itself out at some point but it isn't they're still maybe going. not in this division and, and I, you're and right I, and I'm just, I thought based on stats, based on everything I, I sort of know football has, and it can still happen, of course it can. They can still tail off and they might lose the next five games. Who knows? But they they just have, they find a way every single time. And do you know what I will say? I think a lot of it is, I think a lot of it down to Ipswich has been their fantastic January recruitment. I think bringing in Kiefer Moore has been a revelation for them. Oh. Sami Ento has been a top signing for them as well. Travis in the middle, Blackburn's captain, has been a really good addition for them. Um, and I think they've bolstered that squad a hell of a lot in January, and that is the reason they're, they've, they've been able to sort of get over that hurdle where they won one game in nine. And I think their January businesses... I, th I think we just have to speak on it, lads, because nice. they are just a big problem at this moment in time. But are you on the same sort of mindset when it comes to Ipswich? Are we... Or are you... You know, obviously, I'm not saying it's signed, sealed, and delivered their up or anything like that, but I just... I'm struggling to see them slowing down at this moment in time because they just find a way every single game. <laughs> I think we're in a situation where, in terms of the top four teams, it won't surprise me whatever order it finishes, you know, from one to four. I honestly can see anything happening at this point. Um, you know, because Leicester, performance-wise, other than against us, ironically, they've dropped off a lot the last couple of weeks. Mm. Samson, obviously, on a iffy spell. Leeds, we're getting the results, but maybe not so much being as convincing in terms of our performance. And what I would say about Ipswich is they play so drastically different to the other three teams. You know, I think... The other three teams, including including ourselves, were possession based. You know, we mm. play it quite slow, slowish tempo. Maybe we're a little bit quicker in that our sort of build up play than what Sampson and Leicester are a bit more transitional at times. But Ipswich are a bit of a throwback team at this level in terms of how they play. 
Um, you know, it is a 4-2-3-1, but sometimes it does become a 4-4-2 effectively with, you know, how Chaplin joins, you know, with um, with Kiefer Moore or George Hurst, you know, who's ever, whoever's up top, Kiefer Moore at this moment in time. So they are a bit more of a throwback and they're a direct team. You know, I don't mean in terms of playing long balls, but when they get the ball, you do try and zip it about the park quickly and just get the ball into the wingers and push forward from there. And obviously in terms of their press, they're pretty reliant on the press, but they press incredibly well. And they're a, they're a high intensity team. You know, they are a difficult, you're never going to have an easy game against Ipswich. You know, all for them when we beat them 4-0, but I think that was a particular off day for them and we were particularly on it that day. But other than that, Ipswich have always been in games. You know, they but always the, find a way to stay in games. The thing is with them, Oscar, they are what they've done in terms of how they've grounded out their results. These drastic come from behind, less and some of them like deflection goal. I mean, they, they've they're everything we're not in that sense. They just shoot sometimes and see what happens and some of our players want to walk the ball. But more direct, you know, it's a 100%, right? So uh, I think Ten I'm of two goals. minds about this. I'm of two minds about this. I'm On one hand, I'm like, some of this is luck and it has to run out at some point. You can't keep performing above the expected goals and getting these kind of, what, what Connor, do you say 10 deflected goals? Like 10, yeah. Uh, at some point, you imagine that would have to run out. And then what does that mean? Does that mean they stop winning all their matches? No. It just means in a race this tight, they drop a couple results. Like the logical side wants me, but I've seen so many of their matches where well, I think they're get, out of get, it. Get, and they get, come back get, and win get, it. I'm like, how do they get, do get, it? So I'm kind of get, a believer get, that maybe they could keep doing get, it. Give us, give, us, give us an honest view right now. And this, the yeah. title of the video is this. Give us an honest view right now. How do you see it going and why? Be a fortune teller. You know, you've seen a lot of Ipswich's games. We've all seen Southampton. We know what they're about. A lot of quality, mm -hmm. but maybe not the tactical ingenuity in terms of manager that someone like McKenna has as opposed to Russell Martin. I think Martin has a bit of head loss, and I think we all see that like, frequently online and you know after, after the games and stuff. Leicester, uh, Maresca got a good win the other night. How, how do you see this playing out, honestly? How do you I think see it all it right comes down now? to the Southampton match. Like I, you, I think, you think, it all, you think... You think all this comes down to the Southampton match? Yes, I do. I, I think right. that... I think that I, I can't predict the exact results, but it's hard for me to believe that we're going to win 10 matches in a row, right? I think we're probably going to drop more points, one or two matches out of these next 10. It'll still be an amazing run, right? Uh, like if you win eight out of 10, that, that's fantastic. I also think Ipswich is quote, luck, end quote, will run out at some point too, but it doesn't mean they drastically drop off like, like they did a couple of weeks ago. I think what what's probably going to happen is Leicester gonna, are going to refine their form. They're going to end up in first. And what's going to come down between second and third and maybe even fourth is going to be slim, slim margins. And Leeds are going to be able to punch their ticket if they beat Southampton. If they don't beat Southampton, that's a, us in a playoff, in my opinion. Oscar, that, that's Oscar, my crystal see, ball. How do you see the land, the land line at the minute, Oscar? I think if I was doing the percentages, I'd probably say 60-40. I think we will get top two. Um, yeah. I think the reason I'd say that is it's not like an absolute we're definitely getting top two. I just think I'm more confident than not confident we will get it. I just look at the team. I think we've alluded, alluded to we're not playing well at this moment in time, last four or five games, but we're still winning the games. And there is a lot of, I think with Leeds, there's a lot of other points with Leeds at this moment in time. There's a lot of different context to it. The fact that Pascal has been out for such a long time, you know, massive, arguably, massive. you know, the best ball playing Centre back in the league, you know, in terms of on that left hand side, you know, we know how much of a difference, particularly against these high pressing teams. Huddersfield pressed us high on on Saturday for large spells of it before they went down to ten men. Stoke second half pressed us high. We couldn't quite play through it. So I'm thinking when we get Pascal into centre back or get Gray and Ampadu into midfield, I think it improves our builds up play so yeah, much. But, that we can but Oscar Am respond to that. Oscar, Oscar Ad he's he's. We're going to see Pascal this season. It was. It was first. It was a two-week thing. Then it was four week. Now it's been about seven weeks. It, I'm a little bit worried about this guy. And this is a trend. Yeah, too. he gets um, hurt. Sorry. It's, it's one of those. But I also think as well with it. I actually, my internet just drops them for like ten seconds. <laughs> like, I said he guys. gets hurt and it just bangs out there. <laughs> You're all right, mate. We can. We can oh, go on. You go on. You go on. Just for like ten seconds. Then, um, yeah, it's. 
the other factor as well is obviously getting Roberts to right back and then Gray into midfield. And I just think that improves our build-up play as well. So I still think there's performance gains for this Leeds team. I think we've already shown what we're like when we're fully firing. I think we've probably put together the best spell of any of the four teams. And I think we're still in that spell right now. And I still think we can get better in that kind of sense. Will we get better? Who knows? We still have to find those performance gains, but I think they're there to be got. You know, in terms of Rutter and Somerville are not playing anywhere near their best football at this moment in time, but we're still winning games. You know, Rutter still got an assist last, last night. He still got a goal and assist against Plymouth that ultimately won us a game. And I actually thought the Plymouth away game was probably his worst game of the season, to be honest with you, certainly in the 10 role. And he's got the goal and assist. So we have got that quality at the top end of the pitch that can bail us out. Yeah, obviously Dan James, eleven goals this season. Patrick Bamford, so Oscar, you know, think... Oscar, Oscar, Oscar is, we know he's we know he's a stubborn man. We know he, he can be wedded to certain players. Is he going to make? I would say, what you're suggesting are quite wholesale changes. I think you're leaning a little bit on Joseph as two. well. It's 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 fifty fifty with you and with you and Bamford when it comes to Joseph or him. I think you you're wanting Archie Gray in the middle and you're wanting Connor Roberts at right back. Is the man? going to make those changes because I would suggest that they're wholesale no. changes. So two changes though in terms of Archie Gray will still be he's not like Archie Gray is coming off the bench he's still starting the game just in but different he's positions. absolutely loved he's loved Gray at right back it's his little Aaron's project isn't it that that was his project at Norwich and he absolutely loves that partnership of Gruev and Kamara we know he does it's, it's reliable for him so will he do you believe he will make those changes? Yeah I, I genuinely do um, he's a believer not... he's a romantic He's it's, Oscar. <laughs> he's done it before. Listen, he dropped Perot. Perot had started make, every make game. Leagues, make leagues great again. But Perot had started every game for the first half of the season. And then suddenly he hasn't started. Well, he started one game since against Leicester, I think. You know, or Swansea as well, actually. But, you know, and that's only because of injury. So he is willing to make changes. Will he make them straight away for the Sheffield Wednesday game? I don't know. I actually personally think we will see Conor Roberts stay at right back for the Wednesday game. And that's where you go into midfields. I, I can actually see it happening, um, you know, in terms of in that changes. I, I, I do think he'll make them. I don't think he'll put Joseph in for Bamford, but I don't think he necessarily needs to because I think Bamford's, again, I think he does the job we need him to do up top. Will he be and able well, to do and that? As well, top, top, Tom's just said here, uh, don't understand why we focus on other teams and clubs. We have 10-1-0 in our last 11. We can't do more than we are at the moment. Continue exactly like uh, we are now, and we'll be fine. Well, technically, I, we could be eleven zero and zero, and we could do more. About, this, <laughs> this is what I was about to say. I mean, I mean, it is perfection, but... but we dropped. You know, we, we did drop those points against Huddersfield, which allowed it switch mm. in. So, we unfortunately, right now, the destiny is not in our own hands. So, unfortunately, if we are looking at that top two race, I think this is why we're having this discussion and, and talking about the other teams and and the complexity of this race, and which is also illustrated in the title. Um, you know, we we do have to discuss other teams because the t- there are two other teams occupying that top two. So Leeds, the, you know, the destiny is not in our own hands at this moment in time. So we are hoping for a little bit of a fall off. Continue of anyway. But I think what I'd say is I, I don't think we'll necessarily need to win all 10 games. I do agree, right. agree with Gabe. I think I don't think any of the four teams will win all their 10 games or go on ridiculous runs. I think nerves will kick in. It's inevitable at this stage of the season. Fatigue will kick in. Um, no, I don't wear baggy jeans, unfortunately. I've, I've seen Chinos in a while. I don't think I've bought Chinos in a while either. This is such I've a weird comment. Gabe, Gabe, Gabe does wear crop tops a lot, though. That is, that's, a, that's, a, that's odds on, I think. <laughs> But we only there will be with Rory's mum from all four uh, from all four teams. They will have some surprise results. Like yeah, we will see it happen. You know, Sheffield Wednesday will go to Leicester and win. Yeah, we'll have a crazy one where we'll drop points. It's gonna. It's inevitable. It's a championship. Yeah, it better be the Huddersfield match. <laughs> yeah, well, hopefully it's a Huddersfield game. Um, yeah. But you know, we, I'm even looking at games like say QPR away, the penultimate away game. I know what our records like at QPR. You know, every season, somehow, we always seem to lose at QPR 1-0. I swear to God, if we lose. But we still always lose at QPR 1-0. I don't know how it is. I can't remember the last time we scored at Loftus Road, to be honest with you. So, 3-1 somehow, roof. 3-1 roof. Hat-trick. 3-1 roof. But that's about seven years ago. Yeah, it's Gary Monk, wasn't it? Gary Monk. <sighs> Gary, was it, uh, it was Gary Monk or Thomas Christensen, I think. I think mean, it was Thomas yeah. Christensen, actually. No, um, the great times, anyway, they were. <laughs> um Wonderful football, wonderful football at that, them times. Um, but yeah, there'll be drops off from all four teams. But I can genuinely think the gap will be between first and fourth could be less than 10 points by the end of the season. Maybe maybe even less than that. It wouldn't surprise me 
if with two games to go, Samson, say if Samson are in fourth, they could still mathematically get top. You know, it wouldn't surprise me if something crazy like that happens. I do think it is that tight. Do you think Leicester um, will win it? What's that? Do you think Leicester will win it? You, you, I'm less confident than I was before, and that's mm. not after we beat them. I think it's the response to that, you know, in terms of the fact that they got beat by QPR. Um, I can't remember who beat them before that. Against last night, Sunderland and Middlesbrough didn't they beat them at home. Sunderland last night, obviously it's a good away win, but they weren't exactly convincing. And that was a Jack Clark less Sunderland as well, who were on a shocking run of form. So Leicester can still Leicester haven't had pressure all season. That's something that's worth kind of mentioning. And psychologically, when you go from the first three quarters of the season having zero pressure on you and you're winning week in, week out, all right, maybe not in the most convincing manner, but you are winning week in, week out, to then there's a bit of jeopardy. On it will the line. be the biggest. It will be the biggest choke in football history. Yeah, it would. It would. I don't think, we'll I don't think it will like happen. It. I think they will get top two. I'm not convinced they maybe win it. Um, but you'd have to say the favourites to win it. But I'm not as convinced as before. But I'd be surprised if they, if they didn't get top two. Um, <laughs> I think the gap they've got is all right. Uh, Sly, would, I would love that. It would be mad if they dropped a third. Um, the thing is, if they dropped a third as well. I mean, you look at that playoff. If the, yeah, this is a ridiculous conversation, their manager would 80, set himself on fire. They're on eighty-one points. Yeah, I, I think it's uh, Nigel Pearce that would be in charge for the playoffs if they dropped the third. <laughs> yeah, Ran, Ranieri comes back for a yeah, playoff. A playoff. Mereskas would not survive that if they finished third. <laughs> it, it's not. It's, it's like it is the biggest what, bottle what, in, what, what in you, history. What, you, what are your thoughts? What are your thoughts out of Sheffield Wednesday? Then, because right now they're one of the form teams in the division. They're probably you know up there with us right now. Um, Seem to have turned it round under Danny Rolf. Um, I, I see Leeds winning this one. I see, I see is just having too much for them. I think we'll have learned from the Huddersfield game because um, it is going to be very similar to that. There, there, there are going to be some horrible challenges going in. Farker's got to prepare them for that. Um, rotation is needed. I think a lot of leadership on the pitch is needed. That's where Roberts comes in for me, 100%. Do you know what I noticed the other night as well? He's always around the referee, which a lot of you guys in the comments and maybe you two wouldn't like. I love it. I think it's a bit of gamesmanship. There's a lot of leads. I love it. That I've gone by who don't do that. And he's always the first one in the referee's ear saying, is that a yellow card then, ref? Is that a yellow card? And I, I do like that. You must have um, been a delight to officiate. You must have just been great. Everyone, hey, Gabe, everybody else does it. So why No, no, we? I'm saying, but, but that was a strong reaction. Oscar, am I right? He was a delight to officiate as a player. Yeah. <laughs> and the internet's gone. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's, it's Oscar Switzerland where, over there. <laughs> it, is, it is one of those where, like, for me, you know, you get other teams doing it, and and Leeds for even under the Bielsa era, we had no players who would go and question the referee, and I, I, Roberts does that. It's a bit of gamesmanship. Everyone else does it, so, um, yeah. and I like that side of it. So anyway, you know, I I think we'll be okay, but I think it's going to be a real war of attrition, real war yeah, of attrition. Probably. But I would say, in terms of Roberts, what I like about him was is the fact that when Click and Alioski left, I was worried that the S House quota, I won't say the full words, I don't want to get you demonetized, but the S House quota drops too much. But I think Roberts, there's potential there. There's potential there for him to be the uh, Click S. I forgot about him. I forgot about this little guy. Uh, yeah, Barry Bannon. I but yeah, him. I mean, Ugbo is having an incredible time since he signed from Troy, I think it was, in France. He's scored seven and eight. Or six and seven, he's been on fire up top for Sheffield Wednesday. Um, I so... want a bit of a reducer on one of their players. I want a bit of an Ampadu tackle on Bannon. Yeah, just put him out of the game. Fine, nice tackle, but put him out of the game. Don't mind that. Sheffield Wednesday have won four straight. They're still on 38 points. I know. <laughs> How dire were they before? I thought they'd won five, to be fair. I thought they'd won five on five and six. No. They are on a great run. I quite like the way they play as well under uh, Danny Roll as well. It's it is high pressing, high. I wouldn't say it's directly comparable to Ipswich, but it's a similar kind of idea where it's very direct and very much chasing the opposition from the off kind of thing, getting that ball into Ugbo like they do with um, Kiefer Moore for Ipswich. It is very much you know they are not averse to playing that long ball forward, and they're a miles better team now than what they were at the start of the season and. I mean, we can't forget at the start of the season, we drew them at home. So, yeah, we, we are going to have to... To win this game on Friday, we're going to have to be much better than what we have been last four games. I yeah, would say are. that. Yeah, yeah, I'm not necessarily saying Sheffield Wednesday are better than the four teams we've played um, most recently, 
but the atmosphere, the whole optics of the game, we're going to have to stand up, stand up to it. And we have done that in the second bit of the season, but we're going to have to perform better than what we have done last couple of weeks. And mm. for me, Agreed. the key to that is getting Roberts at right back and Gray in midfield. I really do believe that. I do think, yes, it's only small changes, but I think it will generate... The quality's got to come into it. Quality's yeah. got to come into it. it has Archie to Gray on the ball, for me, is phenomenal. In terms of, I don't think he's a better passer than Ampadu, but in terms of all round, in terms of what he gives you on the ball compared to the other four midfield options as an all rounder, the fact he can carry the ball, the fact he has got that line breaking pass in him, the fact it's off the ball, how good he is, I would say he's probably our best midfielder in possession in terms of what you want all round as a midfielder. I think, I think, I think David think... Davies just said it there as well. I think James could be very, very good in this game. Yeah, yeah. I think this is in a, a game a like match this. Miller made for for Dan James. It is, yeah. You want athletes as well in a game like this as well, you know, to go along with the technical quality. And James gives you that. And Roberts gives you that. And I think it gives you that bit of nastiness down the right-hand side, you know, a little bit of just pace and power that I think maybe we'd have lacked. You know, let's see if they get a red weeks. card. It'll be the third match in a row. A team's picked up a red card against us in the league. So let's see if that happens. I can't believe that donkey got a red the last night. That donkey has got a red card against us and so it's... many times. He's absolutely useless. I know. He's, uh, he's, he's many, a, he's isn't a, he like all time? He's he, a clown, he mate. If you aren't starting for Stoke, you've got to be asking questions of your he's career. A, mate, he's, a, he's, a, he's an actual, he's a disgrace of a footballer. He's a disgrace. <laughs> he played 27, was it 27 minutes he played joke. last night? If you aren't starting game for Stoke on the run they're on, in the position they're in in the table, and with, the, with Lewis Baker, Lewis Baker ahead of you, You've he got makes, to be asking makes, serious makes, questions of your profession. But he makes he makes he makes Joey Barton look tepid in terms of temperament <laughs> on the football field. He's an absolute <laughs> clown. Like what did, you need to sort your head out, mate. Just you could see Ben Pearson against Leeds. What's wrong? With he you? will end up on the Joe, Joey Barton podcast. Is what I'm saying. Oh, he That's absolutely it. will. Yeah. That there are no more there are no more men in football anymore. That'll be the title of the podcast. Yeah, Brett's here saying evening, Connor, Gabe, and Oscar. Hope you're all well. Just like to say, everybody, before we carry on with the, the conversation, it's fantastic numbers we've got tonight on the debrief. Uh, over a thousand of you are in the building. Please like the video and uh, yeah, glad glad you're enjoying this chat. It's, it's a little bit more topical. Um, Byram or Furpo at left back? Oh, God. Um, I think, but it's correct Friday. me if I'm wrong, but I think I think Furpo was taken out because he had a little bit of a knock, didn't he? Mm -hmm. But yeah, um, I don't know. You know, I don't know with this. I mean, Byram. I think did Byram go off with another injury last night? I, I, I didn't quite catch that one. Don't think so. Did he? Good. I didn't know. I didn't see. Well, it. for um, Friday, to be honest with you, for Friday's game, just looking specifically for the atmosphere at Wednesday on a Friday night away. I do. Let's go, I Byram. Do Byram. I go, I, I go back. Not overall. I think over the season, I still prefer Thurpo's yeah. overlapping the fact he's left footed, the combination with Somerville down that side. But for me, Friday night, I want to. Can Rob he do Oscar. it in Sheffield on a Friday night? Robert and Byron. Oscar, at full I don't want to sound like a boomer. I sound like Oscar, a boomer. Oscar, here, a tactical question. At full back. A, a tactical question. If you're talking about Danny Roll playing a high pressing system, if they're pressing high on Byron, I don't like that whatsoever. I do not like that whatsoever because I feel. That if they're pressing on his left side, he's not able to get out of that. Like Furpo would be able to get out of that. I think Furpo would be able to bypass that press a little bit. I think the, the beauty of, of probably Byram over Furpo is that positional awareness and a little bit more discipline in the role, maybe. Yeah, I think, listen, I, I don't think it's a, a, a clear one either way, really. Um, I think it's very much just in this context of the game. I'd go with Byram. I agree with you in terms of on the ball, um, getting pressed. I think Furpo is better at doing that. But I think if we make the other changes to that in terms of having Gray on the right side of the midfield and Kamara or Gruev linking up with yeah. Byram, just having that yeah. free, free role just to drop in and Gray pushes up, I think that can support Byram a little bit more in the build-up. You know, the fact that he's got Gruev or Kamara in close proximity, um, you know, that would help factors. But yeah, listen, I would prefer Thurpo in that regard. But in terms of the overall spectacle of the game, I would go Byron on this one. Um, Byron and Roberts, I just like the idea of having that experience at fullback um, to support you know the younger players in the team you know ahead of them, really. Nat, you're... Nat, what? Nat, Nat really? you're going up against... Nat, Nat. <laughs> I would say... The second so, I, worst I, team in I, the division. I, Nat, Nat, I appreciate you watching, mate. But just a little bit of context. I know you've won four games on the bounce, but you're going up, and, uh, up against an absolute juggernaut at the minute, mate. We've won 10 out of our last 11 games. We're flying. 
Um, and, and you've won four games on the bounce. You're still second bottom, fella. Like, come on, you'd take a draw. You'd snap our hands off for a draw. Mate, trust me, we're dictating this game, not you boys. I'm convinced it, of it. It's going to be a, a cold, cold day if they end up somehow. This clip is going to haunt us. But yeah. Um, I can't believe that. I can't the, believe the unwavering confidence in a team that's second bottom. Unbelievable. Fair play to you, mate. Fair play. Um, or, or maybe he's not saying it would be quite the achievement to take a to take a draw away from Leeds, even though they've won four games in a row. Maybe that's what he's saying. I think Nat's I think Nat's aggressively saying there that he expects a victory. You said I'll take a draw now if you offered me it. That's imagine playing Jazz with you. Someone offers you a draw. Connor's like, what the? F- Get out of my face! <laughs> <Context> <laughs> this aggressive man. offering. Context. He's he's undermining the mighty whites there. Uh, Byron probably understands more about a Yorkshire derby, so probably be up for it more. Yeah, they're probably those things that you can't measure, Jason. But I don't think that's a bad comment to be honest. Um, with you, uh, I'll lead the underdogs in this Yorkshire derby. <laughs> probably sounds like it. Uh, maybe on the Sheffield Wednesday side. But uh, what's what score predictions are we going with then, lads? Oscar, we'll start with you. Um, oh, it's tough. Two one leads. Yeah, I was going. I was going. Uh, I was going very. Uh, I was getting very excited when it came to the Huddersfield game, and we we're getting a little bit of crap. They've just beaten Watford, and I was coming out and saying, "I ah, will beat them three 0 It's going to be great to stuff them." And yeah, it wasn't that sort of game. Um, <laughs> I'm going to go with a really tight, really, really tight. I did say it would be last night. I thought we'd win two one last night, but I'm going to go with another one. I think it's going to be one nil. Going to get another clean sheet, but it's going to be very, very tough. I think we're going to have to wait. You know, I think, listen, they're a completely different side to what they were. And they still listen when they were crap, when they were awful. <laughs> Even worse than they are now, they got a draw at Ellen Road, unbelievably. Um, and Barry but, Bannon was probably best player on the pitch that day uh, as well. So make that is worth. He always plays well against us, Barry Bannon. I don't know what it is. It just, mm. just turns you can't really get him out of, You just can't really get him out of the game, can you? He's almost too small to get out of the game. He's just always there with the low just appears of out of nowhere. Yeah, the ball at his kneecaps. Um, See, look at Nat's contextualized his comments. See, geez, your team, Nat, aren't you? Do you want to just get that Sheffield Wednesday? I, I'm team Wednesday. fair play, Connor. I'm team consistency. <laughs> oh. I'm team logic. There we go. I am the, team rationale reading. Of the, show. the rationale of the show. <laughs> uh, Ryan coming in with a horrendous. Oh, come on, Ryan. Prediction there. And Jamie's backed him up as well, a Patreon. <sighs> Stephen has gone with a 2 1. Uh, Connor Ever, the optimist. I've said we'll win. I can't win. <laughs> <laughs> two 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 in a lead. Sheffield will make it hard. Oh, he's calling them Sheffield. They won't like that. Oh, that, that is that is yeah. They won't like that. It's like that's calling... how you rest, rattle a Sheffield Wednesday fan or Sheffield United fan. That yeah, it's like calling Manchester Manchester City Manchester to a Man United fan. Always funny. Um, if we lose or draw, uh, four nil leads. Um, oh, this would be nice, Mick, in the away end. A two-one Joseph winner. I, I loved it when he scored the other night. That I was so seems. happy for him. Um, but yeah, uh, right. We've got our score predictions in. Everybody, we will leave it there. <laughs> Listen, thank you so much, and and you know, uh, it's been it's been a really enjoyable show. Uh, over a thousand of you in the building. Great numbers. Uh, please make sure you're liking uh, the content. Head on, over, head on over to the Patreon if you want some bonus stuff. Gabe's got his own channel as well. Make sure you check him out on YouTube. Um, Oscar, maybe I'll give my score prediction there. <laughs> Did you get your score prediction in? Nope. You know, sorry, mate. It's all right. Two nil leads. Two nil leads. Two nil leads. Sorry, mate. I thought you had it in. Sorry, right, man. Bad. It's been a long show. My bad. My bad. <laughs> Shocking. Um, yeah, and uh, yeah, head on over to Gabe's channel. Uh, Oscar is just on every single platform that is Leeds United. So type in Oscar Marriott and he'll pop up. Um, check him out on Twitter as well, Oscar Mario. Guys, it's been an absolute pleasure. Make sure you like, comment, subscribe. I'll see you in a bit. Cheers. <laughs>